Karl Marx, who said that religion is the opium of the poor. Religion has been historically used as a means to systematically oppress, suppress, and take control of resources by the elite from the poor. And please don't confuse it with spirituality. Now, as a reverend, I'll focus on Christianity, but Islam and traditional beliefs do certainly take their own share. Here I am, a reverend, okay? And why would I speak so critically of religion? Well, let me tell you a few things about myself. First, I'm a born-again Christian. I'm spirit-filled, I'm tongue-speaking, I'm charismatic, evangelical. So that gives you an idea of where I stand. 23 years, been saved. 17 of those years, a minister of the gospel. Sat under some of the most amazing human beings, but also sat under some very interesting people. I learned something very interesting in that period. I learned that a number of people within religious institutions aren't really about shepherding, grounding, discipling, and releasing, but more about manipulation, control, and selfish gain. But I think the biggest lesson that I learned is just how religion and I really use that word, religion, shackles people to personalities and institutions. I learned a very bitter truth, and here's that truth. Religion is the number one tool for mind control from the elite for the ordinary. Now, there are three distinct ways that, sorry, five distinct ways that this happens. Now, before I do so, I have to give some credit to something. Most people, especially for me as a Christian, know Jesus Christ. That's who we follow. What is amazing is that Jesus Christ was perhaps one of the most anti-religious people I ever came across. In fact, Jesus, throughout his life on earth, preached the kingdom, not institutions. He was so anti-religious that in Matthew chapter 23 in the Bible, you get an entire scathing attack against the religious leaders of the day. So scathing that it literally sealed his fate, death by crucifixion. So, let's ask ourselves this question. Exactly how has the ruling class used religion to oppress and suppress? So let's walk you through five key ways that I've learned. The first one is that they've used it as a means of control. Okay, so religion has been used throughout history to ensure that the elite can take control of the simple. And they've done this in three very specific ways. The first is to push the concept of martyrdom. And what's that? That's basically the idea that you go out there and you do all you can, including dying, if possible, for the purposes of your religious agenda. What's so interesting is that this is done for leaders. But the saddest part, though, is that some people are so fervent about this that they go as far as blowing up people, as we know very well, through the antics of Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab. The second method is the suffering model. Okay, pie in the sky, life will be good for you when you get in the kingdom of the hereafter. So suffer, suffer, suffer. The more you suffer, the holier you are. The irony, as always, is that it's the disciples that suffer. <laughs> The third one is that money is evil. And there's two really badly misquoted scriptures that are used to exacerbate this. The first one, and you all know it, it is easier for a rich, for a camel 
to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the second one, just as badly misquoted, the love of money is the root of all evil. Ladies and gentlemen, those two statements have done more harm towards wealth creation and the concept of, health in Af of wealth in Africa. Global Finance Magazine, 2020 figures. Of the 20th poorest countries in the world, 16 are in Africa. 16. I mean, just think about that. Ask any African. We pray the most. We fast the most. We're the most fervent religious people I know. And yet, all the poverty. So does that mean prayer doesn't work? Of course it does. All I need to do is point you to countries that are religious but very rich. The USA, Israel, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain. So if there are countries that are rich, yet there are people that are poor like us, something is wrong. Anyway, let's get back to our list, shall we? At number four, or is it number two? Let's go with number two, because that was number one. So number two is the justification of kingdoms and empires. There's a reason, ladies and gentlemen, why in chess you have castles, you have king, queen, and a bishop and a knight. You see, there is no greater person that can justify political control than a religious person. And so, throughout history, religion has justified the elite. They call them the noble. They call them the blue blood. And if you bring it close to home, they're called the anointed. <laughs> Third is slavery. And it's one of the darkest chapters in the history of mankind. I mean, for a period, a group of people came, forced religious Christianity on another group, and then captured and enslaved them, shipped them across the Atlantic as slaves. And to justify all this, they say the Bible justifies this. Slaves, in fact, black people are inferior and white people are superior. And it took centuries before abolitionists and, and, and human rights activists came round to fight this revulsive behavior. But that's not before the toll had been done. And here's the big deal. This whole entire scene of slavery set the tone for the fourth factor, colonialism. I'll be honest with every one of us here. Colonialism was the back end of Christianity. See, when the missionaries were sent over, those that sent the missionaries had an agenda. They called it the three C's. Civilize, Christianize, commercialize. So, they came over. But here's something very interesting. As they began to do their work, they brought a very powerful meme, an image of a white Jesus, blonde hair, blue eyes. Man, guy looked just like the missionaries. I mean, and I'll be honest with you, it was powerful, it worked. <laughs> to make matters worse, they took our names and said, ah, these are pagan, demonic names. You better get Christian names. What's interesting, you all know, is that the Christian names were nothing but English names or French names or Portuguese names. They were really not Christian. As if that wasn't enough, ethnic groups. They divided us by the color of our skin. At the top of the food chain were the whites and then followed the Indians and then followed the coloreds, and right at the bottom were the blacks. But you see, the worst was yet to come. 
which is my fifth point, white supremacy. You know, what is sad is that white supremacy was, it had its greatest advocate in religious Christianity. It was religious Christianity that pushed the concept and idea that whites are actually supreme and superior to blacks. Truth is that religious Christianity was used as a Trojan horse to hide this very evil seed. And of course, don't forget the linguistic terms like white is good, black is bad, white listed, black listed, white market, black market. Throw in a good chunk of slavery, appetite, Jim Crow laws, really justified again by the Bible. And then this was enforced by the use of lynching, killing, disenfranchisement of black people, inferior education, inferior opportunities. And what that dad did was essentially kept the black people enslaved through conditioning. And bear in mind, this took centuries. The seed that was further sown, which is so evil also, was the use of linguistics, language, words. I apologize in advance, because this is TED, but I have to use this word. One good example of the use of words caricature, terminologies, is the word nigger. The word nigger and all its related terms was used to further enforce the idea of the inferiority of a black man. You can actually take some, old, some time and go visit the Ferris State University Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia and actually learn for yourself just how harmful it was. The irony ladies and gentlemen, is that these very terms have become the reality today. And so therefore lies the proof in what I've just said. Blacks actually now believe they're so cursed and so inferior that the only way they can measure up is by looking like the very oppressor that brought them down. And skin bleaching is a good example. Another one? is the use of the word muzungu or bazungu or mabwana, which you know mean white man or big boss. And those, by the way, are terms used for fellow blacks that are seen to be progressing. Hmm. Let me illustrate with a real example. I have a friend of mine who got a very good contract recently, a, a deal where he was going to distribute a particular product across a chain. And so he put together a deal, prepared some presentation, got all his details, went and pitched. Unfortunately, in spite of meeting all the conditionalities, his deal was turned down. He had some insight, so what did he do? He called his partners in South Africa, who were white, by the way, ha, 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 and had them come over, and then they pitched with him no insight. I think you know what happened. Let's just say that he has the deal now. His deal and his business is everywhere. But here's the part that's really sobering. The people he spoke to and pitched were indigenous African blacks like you and me. Today, we have seen that many Africans are now at a stage, because of all this conditioning I've said, that we're just about to exchange for another new kid on the block, the Chinese. So what are we doing? What's the solution? How do we come out of all this? Well, my solutions are not gonna be fun, but this is TED, ideas worth spreading. <laughs> so number one, we need to unshackle ourselves from the mental chains of religious dogma and mind control, which is really what religion is about. Freedom of the truth must be a substitute. Further, we must stop following rules and regulations, rituals, and get to the liberty of the truth. Furthermore, 
We must dis, you know, there's so much distance in religious ceremonies and, and procedures, worsened by mediators with selfish motives. We need to eliminate that distance. We need to get to a place where we know the creator in person and know the truth in him. And when that happens, it leads to an epiphany of clarity of purpose and destiny. Listen, it's spirituality centered within. That's the key. Not religiosity centered without, around institutions and people. But here's my big thing. We need a mindset change. And no, no, it's not just a phrase because mindset change, paradigms, it's a big thing nowadays. But no, 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 no. I'm talking about a serious reprogramming. Lastly, we need empowerment. And that empowerment comes from empowering education. Something that's really about releasing people into destiny. Not keeping them subservient to an institution forever and ever till kingdom come. I'm going to end with this saying that you all know. It says, give a man fish and you feed him for a day. But teach the man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. But you know something? I want us to be disruptive completely. Forget about teaching the man to fish. Here's the deal. Empower the man to own the lake. And you feed him for generations after him. Ladies and gentlemen, Africans must learn the empowering truth and will no longer be in severe bondage of religion and its impoverishing hold. But instead, we'll see wealth for all citizens of this very rich continent. I thank you.